Hello everyone. So today we're going to be talking about how to do collision resolution in hashes. Uh, before we did that, I wanted to let people know that the exam is almost done being graded. Uh, everyone has taken it, so you can feel free to talk with other people about it. And then when we're done grading, we will, uh, I think it'll auto-generate an email on Gradescope that the uh, submissions have been released, that you can look at them on Gradescope. And then probably like a day or two after that, after you've had a chance to look at them, we'll open up regrade requests and there'll be information on there about how long you have to do to submit a regrade request, etc. Okay, so for today's lecture, when we do insertion, search, search, removal, etc., there's going to be times when two keys hash to the same index. And when that occurs, that's called a collision. And so we have to resolve that somehow. The ways to do it that we're going to talk about today are listed here. There's separate chaining, and then there's these last three methods are all referred to as open addressing. So we'll look at linear probing, quadratic probing, double hashing, and then after we've looked at all of these different ways of dealing with the collisions, we're also going to talk about how to grow the hash table if it becomes too full. Okay, so the idea of separate chaining is that we're going to have a linked list for every entry in the hash table. So instead of every location in the hash table either having data or not having data, every location in the hash table is actually a linked list. And then the linked list will store any collisions that occur. So if, say, um, orange and grape are both supposed to go to index 6, they both go to index 6, they just end up in a linked list at that location. Now, an analogy of this would be when you go to the grocery store and assuming that it's the store you've been to before, you don't have to search the entire store for what you're looking for. You can quickly go to the aisle that has, say, bread. And then once you get to that aisle with bread, then you might linearly scan through the different types of bread to find the specific one you're looking for. So we get quickly to the aisle, but then we have to do some linear searching. Now, what the goal is here is we want to reduce the number of comparisons for a search by a factor of n. So if we were to put everything in one linked list, we would have to search all n items. That's the n keys. So if we put them all in one linked list, it would be O of n to find one thing. Now, if we put them in m linked lists, then the average linked list is that long. If we have a good hash function, the keys will be spread fairly evenly across the different hash locations, and then the, there might be some linked lists that are empty, there might be some linked lists with several items in it, but the average length should be around n divided by m. The average has to be that. It would be nice if the median was that also. So I don't care if two or three get into one list, I just would prefer that they not all end up in the same list. So then we can reduce the time from O of n to O of n divided by m, and if we get a good distribution and we have a big enough m, this should be basically a constant. And this n divided by m has a name. We use the letter alpha to designate what's called the load factor. So the load factor alpha tells us in separate chaining what is the average number of items per list. Now when we get to open addressing, it's going to be telling us how much of the table is occupied. 
in separate chaining, alpha could be greater than one. Even the average could be greater than one. I could have a hash table of size eight and put 20 items in it. And then I would expect to see the average list be about two and a half items. Uh, when we do open addressing, when we get rid of these linked lists, I just wanted to introduce this now so we understand alpha can be greater than one for separate chaining. For open addressing, it must be less than or equal to one. So the idea of the separate chaining complexity is insert could be O of one time, exactly O of one, if we allow separate, uh, if we allow duplicate keys to be separate items. Now, if we don't allow duplicate keys, if we only allow one copy of each key, then it would be O of alpha to do an insertion because we'd have to see if it's already there or not. We could then do a search in O of alpha time. A removal would be dependent on search. To remove something, I have to find out where it is. That would be O of alpha time also. So we want to have an M, a table size, that's somewhat proportional to M. And if that's true, then O of alpha is O of one. This isn't the worst case. The worst case could still be O of M. We can't prevent it from happening. We just hope that with a good hash function and choosing the table size to be proportional to the number of items that it will be uh, that case on average. It will be O of 1. Now, and so I saw someone ask a question about this. We had this coming up. Um, we could conceivably do something other than linked lists. We could use vectors and we could keep each vector sorted. So that means our insert would still be O of alpha. So alpha is the length of that linked list. It would be log alpha to find where to put it, but then O of alpha to move things over to make room for it. We could use vectors that were not sorted, although that wouldn't really gain us much over linked lists. If we're gonna use a vector, we may as well keep it sorted because then we can do the search in the log of alpha instead of alpha. So that would speed up our search. Uh, we could instead use binary trees. Binary trees would give us log of alpha for search and insert and removal. That would be, again, that would be the average. It would still be O of alpha for the worst case. And, and in the absolute worst case, that could go to, see, the o of, o of alpha would be if we have a stick. And if everything ends up in one binary tree, then it would degenerate to O of n if we have every item in one tree and that tree is a big stick, we could be as bad as O of n. Now there's a larger memory overhead here. When we have linked lists, we only need one pointer per item. If we go to a binary tree, we need two pointers for every item. And this still doesn't prevent our worst case behavior of O of n. To accomplish that, to get worse than O of n worst case behavior, if everything ends up in the same bucket, we would have to use a self-balancing binary tree. And a self-balancing binary tree would then have a worst case uh, so if we use something like an ABL tree, we would end up with the worst case being O of log of N. So all of them still end up in the same bucket, but the binary tree located there is never a stick. It's always balanced. So this could end up being a lot of work and overhead to make our worst case a little better what we'd like to do is we'd like to have a worst case not happen very often. We'd like to have a good hash function that spreads our keys fairly evenly and doesn't end up with everything in the same bucket and then we don't have to worry about this. So the STL uses an implementation of hash tables using separate chaining and it uses linked lists. And it counts on the fact that the worst case of everything ending up in one bucket doesn't happen very often. 
So the, the STL tried to make it versatile. They tried to make it so that the, um, the STL implementation of hash tables allows certain things to happen because it uses separate chaining. When you get an iterator into the hash table, you say, find me this thing, and it gives you an iterator. The iterator is actually a node pointer. So even if the hash table grows, that node might move to a different linked list, but your iterator is still valid. So one of the things about the STL hash table is that a hash table that is the result of a find, that iterator is valid as long as that item is not removed. If other items get added, other items get removed, you still have a valid iterator. That iterator is only a bad iterator if you remove what it refers to. And that would be your fault for removing something and then using an iterator that refers to it. Okay, so open address. Let's look at a different way of doing this instead of the linked lists. So the idea of open addressing is we're going to find an open position in the table and we're going to put it in that open position. So the idea of a probe is I need to do a probe to determine whether an item in the table, uh, uh, I'm sorry, an index in the table is occupied. So I have to do at least one probe because the hash function followed by, which is the translation and the compression, the hash function tells me an index. The first time I look at that very first index, that's a probe. I say, hey, is there anything here? Because if there's nothing here at all, then the item I'm looking for isn't in the hash table. So I've got to check whether this location is occupied. And if it's occupied, I've got to check if it is the right key. So linear probing says every time a probe results in a collision, meaning a key that is not the key I'm looking for, we should go to the next index in the table, modulo n, because we don't want to go off the end of the table. So next index goes like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, back to 0. So when we say next index, we really mean next valid index. And so we make sure to prevent that by, we don't just increment, we increment and do modulo m. Now, an analogy for open addressing would be when you go to the store, you go to a parking lot and you, you pick an, uh, a lane. And let's say that your, your choice of a lane is a hashing type decision. I think I'm going to go to aisle or lane lane seven in the parking lot. So I go to lane seven in the parking lot, but then I see that the very first parking spot in that lane is full. So I try the second one. If that one's full, I try the third one. And, if, and then if the third one is empty, I park in the third one. Now, when I return to leave the store, I say, hey, I remember I parked in lane seven. So I quickly go to lane seven and I start doing a linear search for my car. Now here, if I see the very first spot is open, I don't immediately assume, oh, my car's been stolen. I think, oh, well, maybe, maybe I didn't get to park in the very first spot. Maybe that one was full and that person left while I was in the store. I have to keep looking to see, uh, is the second spot my car? Is the third spot my car? Aha, my car is in the third spot. And this demonstrates something we're going to have to deal with later on is what happens if something is removed from the hash table? How do we successfully do our searching in the face of removals? So when we do linear probing, we are going to make one probe at the starting point and then we're going, if that one is full and it isn't the key we're looking for, we're going to go to the next one, the next one, etc. So it says we, down at the bottom it says we're going to look at the translation of the key modulo m. So that's our hash function, gives us our hash index, our table index, 
And so we do a probe here. And if that one is full, then we do t of k plus j mod m for j equals 1, 2, 3, etc. So every one of these, including the first one, is a probe. And we look until we find an open spot. Now, for this to be a safe operation, we have to make sure that there is an open spot before we tr start trying to insert a new item. We don't want to try to um, add a new item if the table is completely full. Hopefully my audio and video are synced. When I look at myself in my broadcasting software, it looks okay. Um, you might try refreshing your page and then catch up. So might, you might just try one refresh and catch up. Uh, okay. okay, so we, we do a bunch of probes until we either find what we're looking for or we find an open spot. Now, every time we do a probe, there are several things that could happen. I could find an empty location. If I'm trying to insert, an empty location is great. That's what I'm looking for, is a place to put this new item. Um, if I'm searching, then finding an empty location tells me what I'm looking for is not in there. My search has ended. That's still good in that my search is over. Okay, I've just realized it looks like in the future I'm going to have to make sure I close windows before I lecture. I'll be right back. They're mowing the public area here. I'm going to close my windows. I'll be right back. Okay, hopefully that will be a little less irritating. Okay, so we, if we find an empty one, we've either found a place to insert or found a place to stop searching. If we find a hit, a hit is when I find a location that is occupied and it contains an item whose key matches the search key. Now, if I was trying to insert, that would tell me it already exists. Maybe you just want to update the value associated with the key. Um, if I'm trying to search, then a hit is perfect. That tells me I found what I'm looking for and my search is over. Now another possibility is we find that the cell is full. Cell meaning a location, an index in the table. Full means we've found an index that is occupied but the key doesn't match and when we get a full, we go to the next one. We go to the next one until we get a hit, which is our successful search, or we get an empty one. If we were searching, that would mean it's not in there. But if we were trying to insert, finding an empty one tells us where to put it. Now, one thing that can happen is as we insert items into that table, because of the linear probing, we might say, and I'm going to draw on this and I'll erase it because there's more on this slide. I might say, hey, let's put something at, okay, the, the hash function tells me, put it at index 2. Okay, so I put an item at index 2, and then so I, and let's just call this, uh, do a uh, insert x. I say insert x. And it tells me, the hash function tells me that h of x goes to index 2. Well, then if I say, hey, I'd like to insert y, if I get unlucky, the hash of y might say 2 also. So I go, I look at 2, it is full. I look at 3, it's empty, so I put y at 3. Even if the insert of y said 3, it would still end up at index 3. And we're starting to get this cluster. Cluster meaning a group of adjacent indices that are all occupied. Okay, 
So that's that's our definition is is a group of cells in the in the hash table that are all occupied. What if the table was half full? What if the number of items in the table was equal to the table size divided by two? Well then what would the best and worst case distribution look like? And we're not worrying about formulas yet, we just want to know what would the hash table look like in the best case? What would it look like in the worst case? So let's just draw these out. Okay, so in the worst case, what would happen is we would have one big cluster. And it doesn't matter where it is. The big cluster could be in the middle. It could be at the end. Or it could be from one end to the other. Because if I say, hey, someone should hash here, I've still got a linear search through this entire cluster before I find an open location. So the worst case would be everything is clustered together into one big cluster then what would the best case distribution look like? The best case distribution would be something like, I've got an item, and then I've got an open location, and then I'm occupied, and then I've got an empty one, and then I'm occupied, and I've got an empty one. So if every other one of them is occupied, that's better than having them all in a row. Now, the next question is, on the next slide, what is our average cost. So what's our average cost given a best case distribution? What's our average cost given a worst case distribution? So think about that for a second. Okay, so what would our, give you a little bit of time to think here and answer the question while I was at it. So what would be our complexity for our best case distribution? Well, let's think about this. If we've got a best case distribution, half of the time we encounter an empty cell. So in the best case, half of the time we do one probe and half of the time we do two probes would give us about 1.5 probes on average. So that's going to be O of 1. All right, what about in the um, worst case distribution? How long does it take to find us and uh, to find an empty location? Well, I still have a chance. I still have a chance to find an empty location on the first try. If I don't find it on the first try, I've got about a 50-50 chance. I've got a 50-50 chance of ending up somewhere in the cluster. So if I've got a cluster which has n items and I end up somewhere in, in here, what's my average distance to the end of the cluster? Well, sometimes it's a distance of 1, 
Sometimes it's a distance of n. The average would be about 0.5. So 0.5 is I've got a 50-50 chance of finding a full one times n over 2, which is, uh, that would be n over 4 plus 0.5 gives me O of n. So n over 4 is about the same as O of n. So the worst case, well, it depends on the distributions. The worst case would, in the, in the best distribution, the worst case would still be two probes. The best is one, worst is two. But in the worst distribution, the worst case would be n over two. I probe, I happen to look at the very first location, or sorry, it'd be O of n. So I, I look at the very first location in the cluster, there's n items in the cluster, that's O of n to get to the end of it. Okay, then the last question down here, what can we do to favor the best case distribution? Well, one is that we want to make sure that we have a decent hashing function, and we also want to make sure that we don't let the hash table get too full. Now, we've got a formula here. Oops, oh, sorry, we're not quite at the formula yet. We'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, so let's look at also what happens if we delete something, if we remove something from the hash table. When there's linear probing, what happens if I remove something? So let's do a little quick example here. So I had a hash table where um, x was supposed to hash to index 2, y was supposed to hash to index 2, z was supposed to hash to index 3, so we end up at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so x ends up at 2, y ends up at 3 because it got bumped by, by the linear probing. Then z would like to go to 3, z ends up at 4. Okay, so now let's say I want to check is is y in there well the hash of y says look at index 2 i would say oh it's x that's not it y that's it I'm, i found it but what if before i do that what if i do a remove y well then location 2 appears to be empty. And empty is how I know something's not in there. Let's say we did something else. Let's say I did is A in there. And a hash of A says go to index 3. So I look at an index 3, that's not A. I go to index 4, that's not index A. I get to index 5 and it's empty. Because index 5 is empty, I checked three, I checked four, I checked five. As soon as I get to five and see an empty cell, I say, oh, empty cell tells me A is not in there. So now look at what happens after I remove Y and check, or sorry, I remove Y and I check, sorry, I remove, removed X. We remove X and then we look and we say, is Y in there? Well, the hash sends us to index two. When I get to index two, I see an empty location in the hash table, which tells me Y is not in here. But Y might have gotten bumped. Well, then how long do I keep searching? Well, in this case, I would search until I find Y. But let's go back to the is A in there. When I want to know if A is in there, I look at index three, index four, index five. I say five is empty, oh, but maybe a got bumped past 5 to 0. Let's check index 0. Let's check index 1. Let's check index 2. Wait a minute. I just had to search all of them for something that's not there. And we don't want that to happen. We don't want to have a worst case O of n. I don't want removing one item 
to make other searches, force other searches to be O of M. So what we need to do is when we remove X, we're going to have to put some sort of special marker there to say this item has been deleted. We've got to put some kind of mark there that says this item has been deleted. Now, when I see a location that has been deleted, I know I have to keep searching. So when I go to search for Y, I check, uh, is Y in here? I look at index 2. Index 2 has been deleted, so I keep searching. I go to index 3. When I get to index 3, I find the Y I was looking for. Now let's look at A. I say, is A in here? A is supposed to be at index 3. I check 4. I check 5. I see an empty location that has never held a value. I know I can stop searching, and I don't go looking at all of them. I stop when I get to index 5 to the location that's never held anything. So we're going to have to delineate between a location that's that does currently hold something, that some, a location that has never held anything, and a location that used to hold something but does not hold anything anymore. Now actually this, this brings to light something we would have had to do even without removals. Even without removals, we would have to know for every index in the hash table, is it occupied or not? And for that we could have used a boolean. Now, when we look at deleted elements, insert, so when something's marked as deleted, insert considers it to be an empty spot. It considers it to be a uh, miss, and thus it is usable. If it doesn't exist elsewhere, if we're not allowing duplicate keys, we've got to make sure it doesn't exist. Search, however, considers it full and keeps searching. Now, we're going to have to revise our outcomes. So now our outcomes of a probe could be empty, meaning it never held an item, deleted, meaning it held an item but it doesn't hold an item any longer, a hit, meaning we found the key we're looking for, or full, meaning it is occupied but it's not the one we were looking for. Well, let's look back. I saw a few questions there. Let's look back at this example here, the way it is now. Let's say I want to, let's do it. Let's do another example. Let's extend this example. Let's say after, after I've removed X, so X has been removed, I say I would like to insert Y. Well, H of Y says go to index two. Now, if I'm allowing duplicate items, that's okay. I just put another Y at index 2. I've got Y at index 2. I've got Y at index 3. However, if I'm not allowing delete duplicate items, I would say, well, maybe Y got bumped in the past by the item that used to be here. And I would look, so I would look at index 2, then I'd look at index 3, and I would see, oh, look, Y has already been, been in here. And so I'm not going to let you insert this extra copy of Y because it already exists at 3. No, no double insert, it already exists at 3. Now let's say I did another insert. Let's say I do an insert B. And again, the hash of B says index 2. Okay, I get to index 2 and I see deleted. Well, if I'm not going to allow duplicates, I can't just put a B here. If I'm disallowed in duplicates, what I've got to do is I'd check index 2, I'd check index 3, I'd check index 4 because, hey, it could have been bumped and bumped and bumped again by the linear probes, and then I get to index 5. When I get to index 5, I see an empty location. So now I know I can insert B. The question is where should I put it? I should put B at the first deleted location. I should say, hey, this one's now occupied. It's got a B in it. 
So we don't want to leave it at the end. We found an empty location, told us B is not in here. It is safe to insert it. But I don't want to put it at index 5. I want to put it back at the first deleted index I ever encountered. If I didn't encounter a deleted index, if X was still at index 2, then B has to go at 5. But if there was a deleted index, I'm going to overwrite it and reuse that location. Okay, so we had our results of our probes. We have four different possibilities for our results of our probes. However, we've got to keep track of if a location is never been occupied, is occupied right now, or whether it used to hold something but it's now deleted. Now I started to say a few minutes ago when we had, before we worried about deleting elements, we would need a Boolean to tell us if this location is empty or full or I should say empty or occupied. Now, when we go to three possibilities, what I don't want to do is I don't want to add a second Boolean. Adding a second Boolean adds confusion because now I've got two Booleans. One says like true or false, is it currently occupied? The other one, true or false, is it a ghost? Well, now I've got Two Booleans gives me four possibilities. True, 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 false, false, true, false, false. I've got four possibilities, but only three of them make sense. So what does it mean when something is occupied, but it is a ghost versus not occupied, but, or sorry, occupied, but it is deleted versus not occupied, but it is deleted. So instead of using two Booleans, what we want to do is we want to use a variable that can take on three values and only three values. And that's where enumerated types come in. So an enumerated type is a new type that we create ourselves. It is a new type and it, however, it does not hold all of these three things at once. It is a new type that can have three different values. It can take on the value types empty or occupied or deleted. And those are the only three values that are valid for variables of this type. This prevents the confusion of two Booleans. Now, enumerated types might take up too much space. By default, I think they're on the order of four or eight bytes. What we can do is there's an optional uh, syntax here. Instead of putting the curly brace immediately, we can say colon and we can give it a base type. So I could give it a base type like char or uint8 underscore t, and then we put the curly brace. So either a char or a, an 8-bit integer would force this to be one byte. So it forces this bucket type to be one byte. We'll save a little bit of memory. So we create this enumerated type and then what I could do is I could have every bucket in my hash table. Every bucket in my hash table has a key, a value, and a type. And the type must be one of these things. And this is the syntax for comparing. And this is actually comes from Lab 7. Lab 7, we're going to give you a hash table that's mostly done. You've got to finish it and you're going to need to make use of the enumerated type that we put in there, and this is the correct syntax for using that enumerated type. If we wanted to assign a particular type, well, we'd use a very similar syntax. I would say something like buckets sub i dot type is equal to, with assignment, bucket type colon, colon, occupied. So if I, if I needed to insert something, I would check until I find an empty location. I would then pick a location to put it in, either the empty one or the first deleted that I encountered. Let's say that's I. I say, hey, now index I change its type to be bucket type occupied. So we can compare these, we can um, assign them. One downside to them is enumerated types don't see in or see out very well. 
when we use C in or C out with them, it treats them as if they're an integer, which is um, a little bit painful. So if we want to print these, what I would do is I would do like a switch statement or an if else. If you know, so if the type is bucket type empty, I would output the character string empty. The other thing we don't want to do, you could, like I said, you could use two booleans, which is confusing. You could use an enumerated type, which is the best choice. We could also use something like, oh, I'll just use a character, and I'll use characters like E and O and D. That's kind of readable, but, you know, because they correspond to the first letter of the status, what would be, so that would be worse than enumerated type. What would be even worse would be integers. I'll just, I'll just associate an integer with each bucket. Well, what does it mean when the integer is 0 or 1 or 2? What if when I wrote the code, I thought of, you know, 57 million and 23 means occupied and 0 means unoccupied and 999 means deleted. And you look at my code and you see if the bucket type is equal to 999, what does that even mean? So using the enumerated types makes your intention very clear. It avoids magic numbers. We hate magic numbers. Magic numbers are basically anything other than 0 and 1 is magic. And using it without an explanation is bad. This gives us a way to, rather than putting it in comments, we put it in code. The enumerated type will make it safe. Uh, this, this would be the case where bucket sub i is a structure. Bucket sub i is a structure containing a key and a value and a bucket type. So if we wanted to assign to the key, we would do bucket sub i dot key or bucket sub i dot value to get to the different pieces of the structure. Okay, so for collision resolution, there's some formulas here. We are not going to derive them. We're not going to expect you to know them for the... <clears throat> Excuse me a second. We don't expect you to know these formulas. We don't expect you to, to use them on the final, but I will expect you to have the idea of the values on the next page. So what this is, is this is saying, how long does it take us to get a hit? How long does it take us to get a miss? And miss would be the same as finding an empty location. So we've got a hash table of size M. We've got N is the number of items in it. We, um, we know that alpha is equal to n divided by m, so alpha gives us these, these uh, number of probes to get a hit or a miss. So here's what those formulas look like in a tabular form. So what this is showing us is, if I'm looking for something that is in my hash table, this is how long it takes to find it. If I'm looking for something that's not in the hash table, or equivalently, I'm searching for an empty location because I want to do an insert. So I'm either doing a uh, I'm either doing a search for something that doesn't exist, or I'm really trying to find an empty location in the hash table where I could insert a new item. It would be this many. Uh, probes. Now let's look at this. As the table gets fuller and fuller, the successful search slowly increases, but then as the table gets really close to full, this number starts to go up more. Unsuccessful searches, or searches for an empty location to insert something new, go up faster and then really start to spike down here at the end. Why The reason I highlighted the 0.5 row is that's a point at which it still has not gotten really bad yet. 
if the table is half full, either finding something that is there or finding something that's not there and knowing it's not there or finding an empty location to insert something new, still not too bad at two and a half probes. So what this table is showing is that if we implement linear probing, we don't want the hash table to get more than half full. So if it's at the point where we are around half full, we can grow the hash table. And we're going to talk in a little bit about how to grow it. The lab, you don't have to grow exactly the same way we do. If your code is a little different, you might grow like just after it passes half full, where we might grow just before it passes half full. Someone else might grow just before it becomes half full. And the auto grader is actually really cool on this. As long as you do the right things based on when you resize. So it doesn't matter when you resize it. It's if you put things in the right place after you resize. So like we've tested it with doubling. I saw a test builder where we tested it like tripling the size and adding 10. And it's the auto grader still passes it. You wouldn't want to say, ooh, the hash table's over half full, let's make it a thousand times bigger. That would probably go over the memory. But whether you double at the same time we do or not, not a big deal. Now, another way to do probing instead of linear probing is quadratic probing. Now, the problem with linear probing is that because we keep going at an increasing the index by one, if we end up in a cluster, either because it got bumped or because other people got bumped, we tend to grow that cluster bigger and bigger. So if we hit an empty location, fine, we start a new cluster. But if we end up anywhere within a cluster, the cluster gets bigger. So the idea of quadratic probing is instead of adding j, let's add j squared. So at the beginning, things look very similar. So if something was, say, the hash function, so t of key says go to index 2. If that's occupied, then I'd go to index 3. If that's occupied, I would go to index. So I added 1 squared. Now I would add 2 squared to the original. I would try index 6. And if that one's occupied, I would try index 3 squared would be 9 plus the original 2. I'd try index 11. So now I'm trying to get further away from the cluster before I add it. So at the beginning, yeah, I might extend, I might extend a cluster by 1 if, the, if I got an occupied followed by an empty. Then I would extend that cluster by 1. But after that, I will try to jump further and further away to make it more likely that I will start a new cluster rather than extending an existing one bigger and bigger. Now, uh, let's actually do another example. And this is going to take a minute because the I'm going to add a new slide here. And then I'm going to go back to presenting, and this fails. OK. This is going to be looking really weird for a second, because there's a bug in PowerPoint where it doesn't seem to redo the screen properly after you exit out and insert a new slide. OK, so we should be back to a more reasonable place here. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a hash table. Okay, so here's our indices, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So my table size, m is equal to 7. So I've got a prime size for my table. And then let's see what happens if we use quadratic probing. I'm going to demonstrate a shortcoming of it. So I would like to insert uh, key 2, or uh, let's, uh, just, let's, let's just say key 1. I'm doing another example. So let's see. I'm going to insert key one with value one. 
and the hash function of key one says you should be at index two. Okay, so I look at index two, nothing's ever been here. I can put key two here with value two. Now let's say I said insert key one with value one prime. Well, the hash function on key one says go to index two. I find the key is already there. One thing I could do is I could say, hey, let's just update the, oh gosh, I can't, I said one and I wrote two. This is one shortcoming of the slightly delayed lecture video is that you can't tell me that I made a mistake immediately. Okay, so key one, comma value one, and then, and let's say I didn't even do an insert. Let's change this. Let's say I did a hash table, square brackets, key one is equal to value one prime. So the hash function on key one says go to index two. I look at index two. I see, yep, key one is here. Okay, so I return a reference to the value and then the assignment operator updates it to value one prime. And this is how your lab is actually going to work. It's not gonna allow insertion of duplicate keys, but it will allow you with square brackets to update a value. Now let's say I did an insert, or it doesn't actually matter. Let's say I did a H of key two, or hash table, sorry, hash table of key two is equal to value two. And let's assume that hash of key two says go to index two also. I got a little bit unlucky here. So I look at index two, it's occupied by a different key. So that's a full probe. I go to index three, I see that one's empty, it's never been occupied. So I put the key two in there and then the assignment operator. It's actually, I would insert key two with a default value and then I would overwrite the default value with V2 as part of the assignment operator. And we're gonna look at how this would happen in, in uh, separate chaining in a little bit. Okay, let's say I did insert. Uh, key three, comma, value three. And let's say that the hash of key three said go to index six. All right, that's not a cluster, so I check at index six. Unoccupied, I can put it there. So I put key three in here with value three. And then we do one more insert. I say, hey, I'd like to insert uh, key four with value four. And the H of key four uh, happens to say index two again. Okay, so I check at index two, that's full with a different key. I go quadratic probing, would go to index three. That one's occupied, it's, it's full. I go go to, so I go to index two, I'd go to index three, I'd go to index six. That one's full. Now I've got to go, so that was plus four, I've got to go plus nine. So two plus nine is 11. 11 modulo seven is index four, and I find it's unoccupied, so I put it there. So I've got key four, comma value four. And now I'm not quite half, I'm just a little over half full. Let's say I didn't row yet. Let's say I tried to insert another value. Insert key five, value five, and let's say I'm going, to, I'm going to make this bad. Let's say H of key five, I get unlucky again. It says go to index two. So I go to index two, that's full. So I try three, that's full. Six is full. Four is full. That was plus uh, nine. So now I try plus 16. Two plus 16 is 18. Uh, 18 modulo Uh, 18, yeah, 18 modulo 7 is index 4 again. Okay, let's try plus 25. 2 plus 25 is 27. 27 modulo 7 is index 6. That's still occupied with something else. It's full. Okay, so we try uh, 
36. 2 plus 36 is 38. 38 modulo 7 is index 3. Okay, let's try plus 49. 2 plus 49 is 51. 51 modulo 7 is index 2. Still full. This is going to go forever. We've run into a shortcoming of quadratic probing. Is a problem called residual squares. What this says is, if I take a constant, any constant plus j squared, and I take it modulo anything, it doesn't matter what, there are a limited number of remainders upon division. We won't find all of them. Even though almost half the table is empty, we will never find them. So this demonstrates a shortcoming of quadratic probing is that if you get over half full, bad things can happen. So we've got formulas if the residual squares doesn't occur. How bad does it get? And so this formula here, even more complex than the old ones, don't memorize these. Basic idea here is that it's better than it was with linear probing. So at 50%, remember linear probing was 1.5 and 2.5. And this one was something like, I want to say, on the order of 5 and 50, something like that. So those are the linear numbers. So they're better than that, but they're still pretty bad. And we, we again, we don't want to go past half full. And in fact, it could be very dangerous to go past half full if we get into the residual squares problem. All right, so quadratic probing helps a bit as long as we don't let it get more than half full. We do get slightly better numbers here. All right, another method of collision resolution is called double hashing. The idea of double hashing is after your first hash function fails, let's multiply by some new factor. So think of it this way. Linear probing, we took the original translation. So linear was t of q plus j times 1 modulo m. Quadratic was t of q plus j times j modulo m. And now this one is j times some secondary function. So if our first hash function failed, we're trying to make a second hash function that does a little bit better job. So we gave you here an example of a uh, secondary hash function. So we said q, so, so for some prime number q less than m, so we pick a prime number, q minus, so we take the translation of the key, modulo q, we take q minus that, and that's what we multiply by. So what this is trying to do is it's trying to produce different keys have a different thing to multiply j by. So some keys might multiply by 3, some keys might multiply by 7, and this is as j increases. So we'd, we'd try t of key plus 7, t of key plus 14, a different key would try translation plus 2, plan chase, translation plus 4, translation plus 8, or 6, 8, etc. So it's trying to get it so that the we avoid the residual squares, we get a different skip factor for different keys, and that gives us a little bit better chance of not producing clusters. As I said, in lab, you're going to implement linear probing. And as long as you control the hash table size, it works pretty well. Now, the other thing that we'll encounter, no matter what scheme we use, is that at some point we should probably make the hash table bigger. With separate chaining, the nice thing about separate chaining is as we insert new keys, as the number of keys increases, separate chaining the search time increases gradually because a new element goes in that linked list, a new element goes in this linked list. Probably they don't go all in the same linked list. Um, 
but the search time keeps going up because the average length list is getting a little bit longer, a little bit longer. With linear probing, we saw that as the hash table gets around 0.9 full, the number of probes starts increasing faster and faster. And we, we will, it says here may, will reach a point where no more keys can be inserted because when alpha is equal to one, there's nowhere else to put anything. We've got to grow the table. So no matter what our method is, at some point we want to grow the table. So what we can do is pick a load factor, like for example 0.5, and when the table is full, let's grow it. Now when we grow this, we must rehash every item. Now let's contrast this with a vector. When I did a vector, so I had a vector that had, say, two elements in it. So I had, you know, A and Q. And when I say I'd like to push, I'd like to push B, it says, well, you don't have room for a B, so let's make a new block of memory of size 4. Let's copy the A over, let's copy the Q over, and now you can finish your push of B by putting B here. In a hash table, we can't just copy them to the same index. Let's do a counterexample here. So in a hash table, I had, let's say, I'm going to draw this vertically to give myself a little bit more room. So I put key one in, and key one was supposed to hash to index, let's say, index uh, two, right? And I'm going to draw it a little bit bigger to begin with. So I'm going to draw it with like four indices here. So I've got 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so key 1 was supposed to go at index 2. So I put key 1 there. Key 2 was supposed to go to index 6. But 6, remember, modulo 4 says it should go at index 2 also. Whoops, sorry, accidentally changed slides. It's supposed to go at index 2 also, and it gets bumped by linear probing to be at index 3. Now, when I try to push a new value, I say, hey, let's push uh, key 3. I say, whoa, wait, this thing's already half full. Let's grow it first. So when I grow it, I've got to allocate a bigger one of size 8. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, eight. oops, 6, 7, yeah. So I've got location, so I rehash. I hash key 1, goes to index 2, so I put key 1 here. When I hash key 2, it says you should go to index 6, but 6 modulo 8 should go to index 6. They should end up in different places. That's why we have to rehash. So we do something similar. We make a new block of memory that's twice as big. Everything that exists in the original must exist in the duplicate, but we rehash them to figure out where they should go based on the new table size. Because our hash is the translation and the compression, and our compression factor has changed. So, uh, if there were unoccupied locations, like this one never held a value, this one was deleted, they don't get copied over. Empty ones it get ignored entirely. Deleted ones, hey, great, now I've got, I used to have a hash table. In fact, look at this. I used to have a hash table that was half deleted and half full. In my new one, it's a quarter full and nothing deleted. Everything that's not uh, occupied right now is empty. So I've got six empty locations, two occupied locations. So this growth is expensive. But we hope it happens infrequently. So let's look at the cost. We can't guarantee that every operation is going to be fast, but the average should be low because we've got this uh, growth is expensive, but inserting a new one when there is room is pretty quick. So we need our amortized analysis. So think of it, another way to look at the amortized analysis is Every time we insert, we pay a constant cost to insert, and we deposit 
time in the time bank. And the first ones build up a balance of time. The one that forces it to grow has a big bill to pay on time, but everybody put time in the time bank that we can spend. So that's just sort of another way to think about the amortized analysis. Now let's do it with our hash tables. So what we say is we're going to assume we've got linear probing, uh, linear probing because we need it for the cost. We're going to need costs, real costs in just a second. We start with the table size of M and assume it's empty. So I start with the table size of M that's empty and I start doing insertions. Every insertion in there takes uh, at maximum two and a half probes. That came from the linear table, the 0.5, oh, sorry, alpha equals 0.5 rho, because we're never more than half full. So this is the absolute maximum it could cost on average to find an empty location. So each insertion on average costs about 2.5 probes. So the first basically m over 2 insertions cost 2.5 each. That's O of m. Then when the table is full, when I decide it has to grow, I've got to remove my keys from the old, old table. Well, we don't really need remove them. Let's say copy. We're going to copy keys from the old table and insert them into the new one. In the new table, the new table is never more than a quarter full. That means that no, that the probes on average cost 1.5. Uh, I got this from the linear probing table. There wasn't a 0.25 row, so I used the 0.3 row rather than recalculate the values. So I just said, hey, we're never ever more than 0.3 full. That means our average cost to find an empty location is one and a half probes. So everything in the old one has to be inserted into the new one. That's 1.5 times m over 2. Well, now we had O of m while well, we were inserting the first ones. O of m for the one that caused it to grow. That's O of m total. That was the time to insert m over 2 keys. If I inserted m over 2 keys, that means that the amortized cost was O of 1. One of them was really expensive. Most of them were cheap. The amortized cost is O of M divided by M. Divide really by M over 2 operations. So O of M divided by M over 2 is O of 2, which is the same as O of 1. So it's about, because there was O of M for each of them, it took about two operations each. Now, there's a last slide here about the collision resolutions. Remember, these are all referred to as open addressing because they all use an open, they all go to find an open location in the table. Separate chaining is different. But no matter what we do for the first ones, we can do dynamic hashing to increase the table size when we get to a certain load factor. Now that's it for the slides. However, I've got another example to show you, which is going to involve me get my Visual Studio ready. And the other thing is going to, we're going to get the infinite recursion here for a second. Okay, so here's the another uh, example from the sample code folder on Canvas. This is called a uh, hash template demo. So let's look at, let's just run it before we look at code and see what it does. It says, okay, the value associated with my name is zero. We add it to the table. The value associated with my name is 123.4. I removed it. And then I looked up the value associated with my name. It's back to zero. Because if the value, if the key doesn't exist, it must exist. And it gets inserted into the table. 
And then I used subscript with square brackets and removed it. I looked at what it is. I cleared the table. I looked it up. It's back there again. So let's look at what main is doing here. So what main is doing is it says I've got a string. I've got a hash table, which is in another file. I've got a hash table. The key type is string. The value type is double. And unlike unordered map, I had to give mine a hash function and I had to write a hash function. It's up above here. Then, so it says, uh, get my name. Well, getting my the value associated with my name causes it to exist. The default for a double ends up being zero. Then I say, add this thing with a value of 123.4. We print it out. I remove it. I say, remove David Paoletti. Then we say, get the value associated with David Paoletti. It says zero because it must exist. And then I did square brackets testing, which causes it to exist. We remove testing and then we say plus plus testing. This is like our example last time where we did uh, plus plus counts square bracket word to, add, to increment the count of how many times it had occurred. If we clear the table and we look it up, square brackets makes it exist. So let's look at what's in here. This one has a hash function. This one, this hash function is actually from the strings and sequences slides, which we are going to be doing later in the semester. Um, we'll, look, we'll come back and look at this, how it, how it calculates this later on. Let's look at our hash table. Okay, hash table has, should have gone to the top. So the hash table has a static constant for 251 is my table size. This one doesn't grow. I picked a prime number. I made an uh, array of that size and it never grows. If you put too much stuff in here, your performance will keep degrading and degrading because the table size never increases. There's no constructor, there's no destructor. Because this is an array, the array will automatically get destroyed and when the array gets destroyed, it's gonna call the destructor for every linked hash list, which is another file in here. So we've got an array of linked hash lists. This is doing separate chaining with linked lists. A linked hash list containing key types and value types. And I stored a copy of whatever type hash type is. So whatever type someone told me, this is your functor, I said, well, let's make a member variable that because there's gonna be so many functions that need it. I don't wanna create the functor over and over again. Let's just create one and use it. This is kind of like project to be where our base class had a copy of the functor that we used for comparisons. Okay, so I've got an add function. And you're gonna notice these functions are pretty short. You wanna add a key value pair? Well, let's go out to the, figure out the index. So we call the hash function, modulo table size, that tells us the index. And we say, hey, hash table at that index, add this key value and the linked lists add function takes care of it all. And you'll notice there's, there's comments here for each of these because if there's comments before something, tooltip help shows you the comments. Remove, exactly the same, except we call the remove function on the linked list. Uh, if we want to do a get, it does the same thing, except it returns the get of that key. And the um, get, notice, get returns a value type reference. So we look up the key by const reference. We return a value type reference to the value associated with that key. If it doesn't exist, it must exist. We must have a reference. The square brackets operator is identical to the get. It's just a different syntax. And then we've got a clear function says, go through the hash table, call the clear on every one of the linked lists. So really all the work is done in linked hash list. So in linked hash list, we got our compiler guards, we've got our template, we've got inside, we've got a private structure. So this structure cannot be seen by the outside world. So every structure in my linked hash list has a key type, it has value type, and it's got a list node pointer to the next node. I've got a list node constructor, says you must give me a key and a value. 
And if you don't give me a next, I'll just assume with a default parameter that you wanted a null pointer. I use the initialization syntax to initialize the member variables. Notice the order here from left to right must match the order here from top to bottom. If you don't, you get a compiler warning or a compiler error. The list node destructor, so this is if you want to delete a node, it says delete next. Now this is really interesting. Let's, we'll see what happens with this in a few minutes. I've also got a private list node pointer to the head. I don't care about the length of the linked list. I didn't store it as a separate item because we never check the size. We just try to insert new things. If they, uh, if they already exist, we update them. If they don't exist, we create them and we don't care what the size is. Now, my class, my linked hash list, has a constructor that says head is a null pointer. The destructor. The destructor for an entire linked list says delete head, nothing else. So when we delete head, that deletes a node. When the node is deleted, it calls its own destructor, which says delete next. What does delete next do? It has, remember next is a pointer. When we delete the pointer to the next node, it calls the destructor again, which deletes the next node, which calls the destructor again, which deletes the next node, which calls the destructor again, which eventually says delete null pointer. Delete null pointer is a do nothing operation and our destructor is done. This is called implicit. I'm going to put that in a comment here. Implicit destruction. What it means is we basically force the destructor to call itself recursively. Oh, look at that. No pending operation means tail recursively. It calls itself tail recursively and deletes the entire linked list. Now, if we remove an item, we've got to be careful that we don't actually delete the whole linked list. So when we want to go and remove one item from the linked list, we've got to be careful not to destroy the whole thing. But this is a real cool way to do the destructor. Okay, now, I didn't take the time to write them, but to be a really good class, because we do new, because we do delete, we really should add a copy constructor and operator equals. Operator equals will be easy because it's just we're just going to use the copy swap method. Uh, so that we should add a copy constructor, though. Exercise for the student. Okay. Uh, add a node to the linked list. It says if the key is not in the list, it is added at the head. If the key is already in the list, we just update the value. Your lab 7 is going to work slightly different from this. Your lab 7 is actually going to return a Boolean to say, true, I did add it, or false, I did not add it at all because it already existed. So this one's a little bit different. So this says, hey, let's start at the head of the linked list. Well, we've got a valid pointer. If we find the key, we update the existing value to be the new value, and then we return. We are done with this add. Otherwise, we, we move on to the next item. So if we ever find a duplicate key, we update the value. If we don't, if we get to the end of the list, then what I do is I say, create me a new list node my new list node next will point to where the current head of the linked list is. And then I set head equal to that new node. So if I had like keys were, let's say, test and example, and I want to insert the word add, I would go, oh, it's not test, it's not example, I'm at the end of the linked list, create a new, word, a new node containing the word add and add, points to the node containing test. Now the head of the linked list points to the new one called add. So we always add it at the beginning. When I want to remove something, uh, we need a base case here. We need, or not a space case, we need a special case. We're not doing recursion. We need a special case. If the list is empty, we do nothing. 
We also need a special case for if the key value is at the head, we've got to take a node pointer to the head. We've got to set head equal to head next, and we've got to delete this node pointer. Uh, oh, it looks like we're missing a line of code here. I'll update this on Canvas. If we don't set this to a null pointer, when we delete this node, it would take the rest of the linked list with it. I just noticed that. So we need to do this so we don't accidentally delete the whole rest of the linked list when we do this one. Now, if it's not the head, we skip down to find where it is and remember who was previous to it. If we have one, we route around it. So previous points to this node's next. This node doesn't have a next, and then we can delete it. So I did it down here. I changed the null pointer before deleting to be safe. I forgot to do it in this one. And that's remove. Uh, Git does the searching. So if we uh, find it, we return the value. Otherwise, we move on. If we never find it, here's how we add a new key with a default value. This is our anonymous variable again. We say create me a variable of type value type using its default constructor and that's the value you should put in this note. So that's how we got like David Paoletti is associated with zero. Wait a minute, zero? Wouldn't value type here if my value type is double, wouldn't this be the same as saying call the constructor for type double. Doubles don't have a constructor, but when Strustrup created C++, he realized this was needed. That because of templates, classes would sometimes have to behave as if they had a constructor, or sorry, uh, primitive types. Primitive types will sometimes have to behave as if they had a constructor. So in this case, there's basically a fake constructor for double that returns zero. This also tells us that whatever our value type is, whatever value type I put in my hash table, better have a default constructor. If it doesn't have a default constructor, this function can't compile. So we add a new node, we put it at the head. The clear just deletes the head and sets head equal to null pointer, and that's our linked list hash template demo. So this one uses a separate chaining without dynamic hashing. The hash table never grows. When you do lab seven, you're going to be doing linear probing, and you are going to have to make the hash table grow when it becomes too large. Okay, so that's our end of our slides today. Uh, I'll get this uploaded to Canvas in a little bit. Uh, so we've got a copy of the video on Canvas for people that have YouTube trouble. And I'll also update this uh, line of code up here, this one right there. I'll update that line of code and get this saved onto the sample code folder also. All right, I'll see people in office hours later.